Welcome to the Visual Storytelling Podcast. My name is Fred Ranger, and I'm so happy that you're joining us this week for another inspirational conversation. Today, I have with me a special guest. His friend, is his name is, he's a friend, but his name is Octavian. And I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right, so we'll get into that at some point. And Octavian is based in Brussels. He's a street photographer, an event photographer, a fellow YouTuber. Actually, our channels are, if you follow him, you might follow me. If you follow me, you might follow him. And uh, he's also a Leica and Canon shooter. Octavian, welcome to the show. Hello. Yep. Yeah. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm pleased to be here. And finally, like I can see you and I can like properly hear you and like, yeah, we're friends. Yeah. So um, we didn't have any chance to meet so far, but um, hopefully one day uh, uh, we're going to meet in person and probably do some uh, some street photography together. I'm, um, guessing yeah. we'll have, I'm guessing we'll have a little camera on our side that has only one lens and it's 28 millimeters. I'm guessing. I'm, I don't know. Yeah. I'm not sure, but... <laughs> That's probably right. Uh, I'm going to have a Fuji with me. <laughs> oh, no. Well, I have my Fuji too. I can bring my XC4 if you want. We can do that. Or the Q2. You know. <laughs> on, a, on a more serious note, I, I do use a, a Fuji, um, not on a regular basis, but uh, I love Fujis. And um, yeah, I have a like as well. So uh, let's start with the beginning. Yeah, I'm a uh, freelance photographer based in Brussels. Um, and like my main job is uh, doing events and um, um, yeah, mostly events and uh, from time to time weddings. But um, now I'm focusing on, um, on events and corporate pictures. And um, I'm also a street photographer. And um, since like the pandemic started, I'm doing also YouTube, um, yes. and um, I'm I'm really enjoying it. Um, it's it is a small channel, like, but um, it's um, it's it's really enjoyable to to do street photography, to do YouTube, and um, to to work on the video side because uh, I've been uh, mostly like all my life I've been doing photography, and uh, once the pandemics hit. Uh, it was time for me to, to learn a new skill and I start, started doing YouTube and learning to, to edit, to do the montage and uh, yeah. Well, you're, you're, you're very good at it, um, uh, Octavian, because I, I remember messaging you and asking you like, how, how do you film those intros? I like the, uh, the slow motion. I like the, the, the slow pace. And then you, 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 you know, you see Octavian on screen and like, Hey, how's it going guys? And then you would go straight into the the POV street street shooting. So I, I like your style of video, but most importantly, really, really enjoy um, you sharing the process of how you make those images. And I would uh, actually commend you for your use of light and shadow. So um, let's go a little bit back in time. And what brought you to photography in the first place? What was kind of your first, you know, endeavor into the world of taking still images? Well, actually, I, I remember quite quite good. My first pictures uh, were with a Canon camera, like 15 years ago, probably. And there were flowers, so nothing interesting here. Uh, but I was fascinated by, uh, by photography. And uh, very quickly, I developed like a passion for, um, for documentary photography, for news photography, um, more on the, on the reportage side as well. And um, then um, it was like... Um, I started to learn myself photography and um, starting to get into street photography as well. Um, and I was very like young. I was a student and uh, I started to, to work with a press agency back home in Romania because I'm, I'm Romanian. And uh, it was like a part time job, uh, more of a like, freelancing. And uh, then I discovered like my passion for uh, for press photography, but mostly for documentary photography. This was my my first uh, uh, yeah, passion. And would would you say that um, you know all the all that learnings through the years have brought you to use kind of your reportage documentary um, um, learnings into the corporate world or the events world, even the the wedding photography world? Is that is that something you you use and apply in other genre photography? Um, yeah, I guess so. And now I I, I dedicated myself to to do like events and. Uh, mostly events that involve like a reportage and documentary um, approach. So, um, yeah, I think it helped me a lot because um, when you're doing this uh, this kind of um, of reportage of of, of of pictures, you you have more uh, 
you try to be you tend to be more creative um, to find different angles to to tell a story so um it helps you it helps you globally like i would say like street photography when you're trying to do street photography when you're doing street photography it helps you not only be better at street photography but it improves your other other um, um i don't know types of photography even portrait even like if you're starting to do um portraits of people on the street uh you're gonna then you, if you have like corporate portraits though maybe you're gonna you're gonna be better because uh, uh you're understanding light better you're understanding like um, the conditions that you have in front of you, these are the conditions so you cannot change anything. So you, you're going to just be better at, uh, at what are they doing. So, yeah. And, and let's talk about your street photography, because this is something you've invested a lot of time over the past couple of years. You've documented uh, a lot of it on, on YouTube and for the benefit of, of all the view- viewers, including me. Um, what, what, interests you in street photography why why are you deciding to go out you know early in the morning or hop on the train and document the streets of either brussels or or when you travel um first of all i guess it's it's really my love um, and my passion for people i really love people um i love being out so that's why i decided to um, to be a photographer because i've studied uh, other things and uh, i really wanted to be more uh, um, to do some more field work to do uh something that's more dynamic and it's more creative. Um, so yeah, first of all, I would say that's uh, my, my passion for people. I love streets. I love being um, outside. I hate being outside when it's raining in Brussels uh, and it's way, it's raining quite a lot. So uh, uh, yeah, yeah, we're unlucky a little more, bit. More in London, Octavian? Is it raining more than in London? Like, is that what you're saying? <laughs> uh, people still debate on this, but um, it's, um, I guess the... the, the um, the part that really sucks here in in Brussels is the lack of sun. You have like uh, I don't know uh, days or weeks when you don't see any sun. It's like gray. I don't know if the weather is the same in Canada, but it's yeah, it's like basically the same in, in London as well. I guess with lots of rain and yeah. But it but it makes for some good photos, right? So I've I've seen you in total pouring rain, and you managed to pull out some some interesting shots, right? Yeah, yeah, but I don't quite find the motivation to go out when it's raining. I, I have to be, yeah. I have to be honest here. But uh, when it's sunny and when the weather is is great, I just, uh, I just feel like going out and and spending one day in shooting street photography. So um, yeah. And, and and Octavian, who who inspires you to, you know, pick up your camera every day and and do that personal type of work? Is there is there someone or a book or a movie or, or something that actually motivated you to say, you know what, I'm going to be eight hours out and shooting photos. <laughs> well, I, I have like um, three major like photographers that inspire me. Um, there's Matt Stewart um, and there's uh, Alex Webb and a, a friend of mine actually that's living in Bucharest and I, I really love his work uh, his name is Cosmin Gurleșteanu he's uh, he's a very good street photographer based in Romania and um, sometimes i don't have like uh, the motivation or uh, the urge to go outside and I, I just scroll on instagram and i see some pictures from Matt Stewart or uh, Alex Webb or my friend Cosmin and i say wow these are some great pictures. I would like to do some great pictures as well. And even though I go out for one day and I come back with uh, uh, no pictures at all or only bad pictures, it's still a successful uh, successful day because uh, I spend a day outside uh, doing pictures. So yeah, yeah, it's it's so you, you talk about Matt Stewart. That's and and of course Alex Webb, the the master, the great, the master of layers. Um, I I think to your point when you feel like you're in a creative rut, it's so easy now to either hop on Instagram or to grab a book. I actually recommend grabbing a book, to be honest, versus Instagram. Instagram is instant gratification. You can see um, on-demand inspiration, but you can also feel a bit weird after scrolling through Instagram, right? And, and it skews towards something that works for the algorithm, which has, you know, nothing, <clears throat> sorry, nothing wrong with the algorithm. But um but it does serve you a certain type of photography. Whereas in books, if you're buying a book from 1996, uh, well, those were the photos that, you know, that photographer wanted to share at that time. There was no playing the algorithm or anything like that. So I think books are 
are very interesting. Matt is definitely way out there. I love his work. And um, and also you mentioned uh, Alex Webb. I think The Suffering of Light, uh, I don't know for you, but that book for me was a revelation. I went through all the pages and I was in awe in at every single photo that was shown in, in that book. How about you? Actually, I remember seeing Alex Webb um, work like uh, a couple of years ago, but I didn't like, um, felt very drawn to it. And I've recently rediscovered it and I watched like all the videos on YouTube, uh, all the books that I could find. And uh, this this inspired me to work more on layers, to get more layers in my pictures. And uh, I love challenges. I'm, a, I'm a, like a person that really loves to to challenge itself, himself. And I'm, I'm really um, uh, into it, into layers, uh, trying to work my pictures, to work the scene, to get more layers. Uh, so, uh, yeah, this is like really a, a source of inspiration uh, for me. And uh, I, I'm grateful now I can like fully uh, understand his work and uh, trying to, to get better at street photography by, by watching his pictures. So, yeah. Yeah. And would you say that, um, you know, being in the photography business, so making a living out of photography, do you find this draining, inspiring? Uh, because I've talked to a lot of people in the business that said, you know what, I'm, I'm kind of burned out because I, I shoot throughout the day, the weekends and so on and so forth. Um, is, do you find it hard for you to have personal passion projects like your street photography and also having a camera on weekends and on nights and events and so on and so forth? sometimes yes when i have like lots of work and i don't have any time to like to decompress to go out and shoot street photography i really find it um, very hard especially when it's sunny outside and uh, we don't get lots of sunny days in uh, in belgium um, <laughs> but i love it as well because um, working as a freelancer uh, it gives you like it gives me more time during the week sometimes or i have um, two days where i can focus on my uh, youtube videos or i focus on street photography so um it's like for me it's a, it's very way uh, it's very um, like they say good balance so um i'm i'm not complaining from this point of view but uh, Sometimes when I finish work, so like let's say I'm taking pictures of a conference or an event, I finish work, I just want to take my camera and to do some street photography. It's it's a, a way of decompressing and a way of like uh, unwinding after uh, eight hours of taking pictures in a room, you know. So yeah, I can I can only imagine the uh, the feeling after eight hours of shooting. Your the hands must be hurting uh, at the end of the day. Yeah, it it, it happened to me uh, quite often. Yeah, especially if you're doing like this kind of events and you have like a, a conference on three days and you start like at nine o'clock and you finish at six in the evening. It's uh, yeah, it's it's pretty hard, but. Uh, um, otherwise, when the days are longer and you can go out and do street, even starting at six o'clock or seven o'clock, just one hour of street photography, it makes a difference. That's for sure. You, you, your love of people, I want to go back to that because that's something that, you know, I would describe your photography as very human, you know, like portraying human life and human, I would even go to, to say human interaction or, you know, connection. It doesn't have to be two people in your image. You do have a lot of those interactions between between two humans, but sometimes it's somebody interacting with themselves. I, I see a photo of a guy with his hands on his uh, face in an elevator, not elevator, but el escalator. And, uh, and that for me is a very nice picture. Also the tones and so on and so forth. But at the end of the day, how, how do you choose to capture a scene? What what triggers your... The trigger, if I may say, you know, what, what makes you press the shutter when you see a scene unfolding in front of your eyes? Um, sometimes it's it, it's just a simple gesture. Sometimes um, it's the light um, or expression. Um, it's uh, I just don't. I I want to like um, to capture like a thing that happens once, you know, and it it never like happens again. Um, but uh, there are lots of people when I well, lots of pictures when I take uh, take pictures of people and uh, they I don't keep them because they are not not pretty good. But um, I want it to be a little bit like unusual or out of the ordinary. You know, it has to be something that uh, 
somebody will look at the picture and say, wow, he captured that gesture or he captured that expression. That's nice, you know. Um, so I'm trying to, to, to give a little bit more depth to, to make people like, well, yeah, to tell a story that that's that's pretty hard and pretty pretty uh, pretty complex but um ideally would be to, to tell a story and to have um yeah, people wondering what's what's happening in the picture or why he's like i don't know uh, having um, his hands on his face or so yeah trying to get a little bit more depth into into my pictures yeah i really like where where, where this is heading because as you can imagine this is the visual storytelling podcast so it's all about you know, telling stories. Um, what makes a good story for you? Because again, it can be something unusual, can be a, a gest gesture and so on and so forth. But um, when you look at other people's work, what makes you tick? What makes you appreciate the visual story that you're looking at? Personally, when I look at a good picture, uh, sometimes I ask myself, what's going on? What are the surroundings? What, like, what, what is happening? Why is the subject uh, having that interaction? Um, and you, from, from that, like, from asking these questions, you can, you, you can start, um, um, like, developing a story in your head. Um, so, for me, it's, it, like, you have the odd, like, the, the photographer that wants to, to communicate something, and the reader, you, the person that sees the picture, and uh, has it, its own scenario or it, it, it has on his own uh, um, uh, side of story. And this is very, very interesting. It has to be like a picture that, um, that you know, once you see it, you, you start to ask questions or you just, it's just a, an intuition. It's a, it's a simple observation that you say, wow, well, this picture is great. And then when you start to, when you start to analyze it, you, you just see that the picture is, uh, is pretty good. So, yeah. Speaking of those pictures, Octavian, I'm looking at one that is fascinating. Uh, I'm, not, I, I'm sure you'll remember it, but uh, it, it was a, a while back, 77 weeks ago. <laughs> but 77. Okay. You've got a guy that's kind of like uh, crouched and he's looking at a gun on, uh, on the street that's laying down and there's a condom, <laughs> you know, just next to it. And this scene is surreal. Can you can you tell us how you spotted that and and what the hell was happening there? <laughs> Actually, um, that's a toy gun. So, uh, thank just, you for um, confirming. <laughs> now I'm, I'm not sure. Start. I'm not sure that on the left side there's a is a condom, but uh, it's like um, it. yeah, maybe it's a, a chocolate uh, envelope. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, pro probably that's uh, that's the case. Um, I saw this this person. I didn't have my GoPro, so normally when I when I go out, I go out with my GoPro. I'm setting myself to a target to do a, a YouTube street photography video, so I carry my my camera with a with a GoPro on it. Uh, but this time it was just a, a short walk in the city center, and I had a I didn't have any time to to do a, a video so i said to myself i'm just going to take my uh, uh, my camera with me and uh, he was probably packing his toy gun for i don't know for his kids maybe or i don't know but uh, it was just interesting to see a gun on the on the floor and uh, someone just um, uh, with the back and uh, it it's, it was just a, a nice surreal uh, scene uh, in belgium otherwise belgium it does is called, look real uh, I, i will i will i will say that it it does look real <laughs> But yeah. it's good that it was a toy. Yeah, I, it does have the little yellow thing on the on the handle, but uh, I don't know if that's a sign or no that it's really not. But again, great moment. You just you spotted it, and would you say that photography brings you a level of awareness that, especially for street photographer, that you didn't have before you started to chase those moments? Um, yes and no. Actually, I was uh, I was always curious by nature, so I just uh, without a camera, I'm just looking at the people, looking at their faces, and trying to to see if they have a story behind. You know, just in my hand, it was like uh, I was just looking at pictures. Some sometimes I was I was just uh, staring at people on the on the street and just look at them, and uh, I I tried to like develop a story in, in the back of my head, but. Um, I'm, I'm very curious. I have a, like a very curious nature and, uh, um, street photography. Um, um, it was, for me, it was a lesson to be, um, to anticipate more because, um, if you're curious, then, uh, um, you're prepared. So, um, if everything happens on the street and then, uh, 
you're curious, you're there on the spot, you're aware of your surroundings, um, you're going to anticipate more and more, I guess. Mm, yeah, that's that's so true. The uh, the aspect of uh, of anticipation is is what I think makes uh, you know a good street photographer. Not not that there's any specific qualities you should have, but that that's one that if you have it, um, being able to anticipate the moment. I'm thinking about you know the great uh, street photographers like Joel Merritt and you mentioned uh, a couple others. Uh, those guys, I don't know. I don't know how they, yeah, how they yeah. did it. but uh, And again, we're only seeing the good work. I'm sure they have thousands of thousands of bad frames. They, they even admit it themselves, and everybody has bad frames. But the level of awareness that gives them, and anticipation, gives them the ability to frame a shot before it happens. And there's, yeah. there's cameras that can help for that. And I, a lot of people are shooting Leica cameras to do that. I know you're not shooting the... The rangefinder style of camera, but uh, you're not shooting the the, the, the real rangefinder like the M10 and so on and so forth. I know you tried it, but what what made you go to especially for street photography? Uh, and I know you shoot Fuji, but mainly with the with the Q2 and the and the Leica system. Um, actually, I I started with the um, I bought the Ricoh GR3 a couple of years ago, and that was my only camera for street photography and that was my camera to go um, to go out and um, shoot um, shoot street um, afterwards um, there was the Leica Q2 um, coming out it was advertised I, I, I've seen lots of reviews I've, I've read a lot about it and I said to myself I'm just going to buy this camera the Leica Q2 and I'm going to stick with it and it's going to be my only camera that I'm going to shoot uh, from now on so I sold my Ricoh I bought um, the Q2 Afterwards, I bought a, a Fuji, <laughs> but um, um, I love the Fuji simulations. Um, I have never used, I actually, I've used recently just once the, the Leica M11 uh, monochrome. And yeah, I saw that in your video. Nice, uh, nice shots, by the way. Thank you. And uh, it's, um, I love the experience. I'm, I'm not used to, to do the zone focusing. I'm not used to, um, to this um, type of cameras, but uh, it's, it, it has some something that's a little bit magical you know first of all i was like surprised how the the files and how uh, when you press shut the shutter it really f um, feels like you're you're still shooting film uh, this is my opinion i may be wrong i agree, and, uh, I agree with you <laughs> and it it gives you like this um for me it was like uh, it, it gives me this this patience i i don't i don't shoot like uh i don't know 300 pictures in one hour i just take my time i just uh, uh do the the focus um I, I take two three shots then i change the position it's just uh, i don't know it's something it, it, it is something about it that's um, uh that's wonderful and uh, uh probably it is a unique experience shooting with a like a rangefinder camera and uh it's a this is the price that you pay for uh for a unique experience yep. it's a, a <laughs> Uh, it's it's very pricey, but um, I would say it's um, it's an experience that you cannot find without a, you cannot find with with any other cameras, and um, I love the files as well coming out from the from the like uh, uh, monochrome, and um, um, yeah, uh, that's uh, I I love Fuji as well. I'm just going back to Fuji because I'm working on a video with the Fuji, and uh, I recently. Um, uh, did a recipe on my my Fuji XC4 uh, Portra 400 uh, recipe, uh, which looks absolutely great on great on the Fuji, and I'm I'm really I'm really satisfied with the pictures. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, I I do still think like the cameras uh, are just some tools in order to use your creativity. Some of them are are better, or some are they're intended for street photography, and they will probably uh, give you a nice. A better experience shooting street photography. I cannot see myself going out and shooting street photography with my with my Canons, even though they're like great cameras. Uh, yeah. Uh, although I think you did, didn't you do a video with the uh, with the Canon in the street with the big lens just to prove that you know you can do it. <laughs> um, I've done with the Canon, but uh, um, it was a, a mirrorless cam Canon, a, a, a small one. Oh, okay, um, okay. So it was not the big DSLR, like it wasn't. A, no, but I've done with the Hasselblad, with the Hasselblad X2D, and uh, it was a pretty nice, nice experience. But I focused more on portraits, uh, and it, it's a brilliant camera, not intended for street photography, uh, but yeah, it's it's pretty big and uh, 
chunky. Yeah, for sure. Spe- uh, film simulation, I, I, I love them too. I've, I've, I don't know, I started with Nikon and then I moved on to Fuji X100 and that's the original one. I think they were calling them Fine Pix X100 yeah. back then. And, uh, and the rest is history and I've been a loyal fan of that uh, system, uh, especially the XE4. And I want to talk about that because that's kind of for me and I, I, I want to see if you feel the same. For me, it's kind of the ultimate Fujifilm camera because it's so small, it's pocketable. I mean, you do have to have certain space in your pockets, maybe not skinny jean pocketable, but who wears skinny jeans in 2023? That's another topic. That's another podcast. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but it's so small. It has all the, the film simulation. I think it's just missing one, like the latest we have in our you know, latest, latest uh, Fuji. Yeah. But the, yet the sensor is so great. It's so small. You can have all the lenses you want. Especially that twenty-seven uh, two eight. That's that's one that I really enjoy because it's a pancake lens. So for me, it's the it's the ultimate. Although the the cheapest or one of the cheapest Fujifilm cameras for me, it's the it's the ultimate one. How do you, how do you feel about that? Actually, that's my topic to my to my next video on YouTube. Oh, there you go. <laughs> We're aligned then. <laughs> that yep. Yeah, that I'm working on it. So it's. Uh, um, actually, I don't use the 27 millimeters. I've sold it, and uh, I bought the 18 millimeters, which is more like uh, my focal length of, uh, of doing street photography. Uh, yeah, so but the cam- 28, right? But the camera, I love it, and some uh, some people say this is a baby X100V. Um, personally, for me, it's if I can like. Um, say it like this way it's like my rico gr for me it's uh, as you said it's where uh, you can put put it in a pocket and just go out and street the image quality is absolutely great it's pretty fast and um it, it's it's really a great camera and sadly it's it's been discontinued so it's it's been cancelled i am, i have no idea if the, the line xe uh, it's cancelled or just uh, the camera or maybe it's a new uh, new camera coming uh, very soon but it's one of the that i don't know one of the the greatest camera that i i, I had the, the chance to use on the street um and uh it never disappoints you know yeah it's a it's an interesting move from fuji to discontinue it but uh, at the end of the day i think they've you know they're a business sometimes we like to think that these camera brands are you know only thinking about photographers and street photographers and this and that but as a matter of fact most of those companies where they make the money is to optics for medical you know stuff so that's you know the cameras are great but it's it's one revenue stream among others and if you don't see that the numbers are there because as much as octavian and fred and and uh, Fa- uh, Fa- Fa- and all these guys love their xe4 maybe they didn't sell you know to expectation and it's their prerogative to decide to to close it down or no. Although, like you said, it might be, and we've seen it in the past, where they discontinued a model and then a new one replaced it. So hopefully that's that's the case for that style of camera at Fuji. But they've got, you know, there's other choices if you're interested in a small Fuji camera. Of course, there's the X100 if you can find one, but the used market... You know, I would I wouldn't go V right now. I, I I sold mine for a price that I'm like, okay, you want to pay that? Pay it. But, uh, <laughs> so, but so you're one of those guys, huh? No, I no, I didn't I didn't put it like you know some people put it two thousand dollars and stuff. I didn't do that. What I did is I put it for the same price I paid it for, okay. and somebody was willing to pick it up, and and you know it was a fair deal. I, it's like if I rented it for a couple couple years and then uh, somebody wanted it, and my my stuff was clean, so. Win-win situation, and uh, you could he couldn't find one anywhere, even on uh, or one that has a decent price um, anywhere. So I, I, all that being said, I think uh, there will be always rangefinder style cameras at, in the Fuji lineup, whether it's the X Pro, XE, or other types of cameras that will come up, and that's a good news because as much as I understand the XT line and the XH, I have an XH2S for my videos. Um, it's not for everyone, you know, it's, it's, and it's a bit more like your cannons, uh, when you shoot on the streets with that. So, but yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Talking about, um, revenues and, um, like, I feel like the, I don't know if it's street photography is becoming more and more popular nowadays. Uh, but I have lots of people that, um, sent me messages, um, saying that um, after watching the videos and lots of videos on YouTube, uh, they decided to go to to buy the Leica Q2. Um, 
Fuji X one hundred V also uh, it has like it 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 has a terrible su- uh, um, like extraordinary success um, among street photographers and um, that's probably the the reason you cannot find it anywhere to to buy it nowadays. So yeah. um, I feel like the, the Leica Q two and the Fuji X one hundred V there were like cameras that that sold um, very good and uh, I don't know if more people are getting into street photography, but uh, these are this, uh, yeah, the cameras well, that you, it's to be honest, hard to find. Ju- ju- yeah, exactly. And and judging by the number of messages I get through DMs and YouTube comments and so on, I think you are right. I think more people are getting into it. It's a very nice creative outlet. It's something I even you know consider it as therapy. Uh, and I know you you feel the same. You just mentioned it earlier in the the podcast for you. Just going out, the act of going out, being on the street breathing some some air versus going in you know in a inside room or your your studio and so on and so forth it's it's very healthy so it's uh, it's not just you know the photography that's interesting it's what comes with it and then you meet people interesting people uh you you go through experiences some that are positive negative neutral like it's 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 the whole thing right so i think uh, uh, it's gaining in popularity and also i mean the xe4 correct me if i'm wrong but it was like 800 bucks or 850 so it's quote unquote affordable to get into, you know, the game, and you get a very very capable camera. Actually, it's, <laughs> if you compare it to like a Q2, then you're like, well, you know, maybe that's there, there's something there about brand and brand equity and so on. But uh, but the XC4 is very capable for the price. Yeah, I, I fully agree with you. The the price, and I got myself my my camera on second hand, and it was a, a very good price. And uh, I I'm really enjoying shooting with it um i don't know if you have the same feeling as me but when i when i go out with my fujins and take pictures i, I just look at the pictures that i took and with the applied simulation on the, on the on the on the camera i just feel like it gives me uh the incentive to shoot more and uh, the desire to shoot more and i really like um the way the picture is sh- is shown on the on the screen and it just motivates me to, to get more pictures and i love this this kind of feeling and it's the same thing with my leica q2 it's it's just a it's, it's a beautiful camera and aesthetically when you see it uh you just want to pick it up and go uh, go out and shoot street photography even though if you're not like having a good day as you as you said like walking getting some fresh air uh, talking to people I, I love talking to people on the street uh, and uh, meeting i don't know performers on the street and um, having a chat um at the end of the day you you just feel better uh you know so uh yeah yeah, yeah. no i'm i'm totally uh like you and and that's something that uh, i even shot a whole series uh called life's a beach and uh <laughs> it was i will admit it it was all film sim and it was actually the porto 400 v2 and nice. i posted it like that and i'm satisfied and people are reacting well and some people are buying prints so wow we, I went from thinking that you need to absolutely edit every single image you shoot to shooting on the beach with that film sim, posting it, and and voila, you're done. <laughs> so that's pretty powerful. Um, and not a lot of camera brands can do that. That's pretty much only Fuji. And I agree that the, the files look already good on the back of a Q2, but I still edit my, my Q2 files. I don't, I don't use the JPEGs. How about you? Same here. I I always shoot in in, in RAW with my uh, with my Leica Q2, and then I edit my pictures in uh, in Lightroom. I love I love a little bit of uh, more to give more contrast to my pictures. Uh, but now um, using the Fuji, I'm starting to 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 use the JPEGs, and uh, the only minor thing that I do it's cropping and maybe some uh, some uh, some contrast on black and whites. But that's all. Um, I love this that you can do this, um, and it's. Uh, it's a process that doesn't take uh, much time, uh, and I'm trying also to shift from my style of photography to working more, as I said, with with layers to involve more people, more um, to get more depth in the pictures. And this is one of my, uh, uh, let's say, my goals for uh, the next uh, coming years to to get to get better pictures. That's a that's a very good goal to have. Uh, always twenty eight millimeter so so you you don't want to venture into other focal length you you want to master that that focal length is that is that also a goal of yours in in the next year 
I, I feel like, yeah, 28 is, is my focal length, is the focal length that I prefer. 35 millimeters is the maximum that I, I would personally go. That's, that's nothing wrong with going above. But uh, I feel comfortable at, at 28 millimeters. I love going uh, close to people. And sometimes I love even the, the interaction having with people when they're they're noticed that I'm, I'm taking pictures of them, you know, and they're like, uh, sometimes they're confused. Sometimes they're a little bit may, maybe angry. Um, I just love this type of interaction, you know. Um, but 28 for me, it, it gives me enough space to, to get close to the to the subject and to, to get more in the frame. So, uh, yeah, this is my, my preferred focal length. And what would you say was the biggest learning in starting that, street photography endeavor, you know, shooting almost every week or, or, or even every day, and also meeting all those people, bringing your camera, you know, everywhere you go. What was the bit, the biggest learning over the past few years? Hmm, the biggest learning? I, I have two lessons. Uh, one is I actually started to do street photography a long time ago, like when I, when I was into press photography, but then I stopped. Um, I stopped because uh, I said to myself, I need to focus on, the, on my business now. I need to get more clients. I don't have time to, to waste on doing street photography. So I need really to, to learn how to promote my website, um, to, to get more clients, to get more work recommendation and so on. So one of my, my biggest um, lessons to learn is actually my biggest regret is that um, I've stopped doing street photography for a couple of years. And um, the, the second learning probably is that uh, it's it's impossible to do uh, uh, good um, pictures like every day. You have like days or weeks when uh, you're, you're just not inspired or um, pictures are not coming out the way you want. And... Uh, um, you you were talking about Instagram, and I, that's one of the the reasons I really love the the podcast with uh, with Lucas. Um, you you scroll on Instagram and you see lots of lots lots of good pictures. You know, like uh, there are lots of photographers, and you have this volume, this immense volume of of good pictures coming to you, and it it builds up a, a frustration because you're you're going out two three days and you're not getting any good pictures, and Instagram feeds you with very good pictures. You know, good good portfolio and good pictures especially this um, large account of um, large accounts of street photography so um, it's like it, it takes patience it takes practice so you it, it's impossible to do uh, it on on each outing good street photography you know so basically these are the the two yeah. lessons that I, i've learned and, and again i go back to our earlier point don't feed yourself only social media and especially Instagram because it's not the reality. I, I love when Sean Tucker or, you know, people like that talk about the failures because I think you learn more from the failures than the, the successes. And that's not everybody who's ready to do that. So I commend people like Sean Tucker, Mad Day is another one where he, they share, you know, what's not going well and how they got to a point where, they wanted to quit photography or whatever. So that that for me is way more insightful than seeing somebody doing bangers, whatever whatever word is trending, bangers on Instagram. You know, like uh, and 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 I see a lot of those, unfortunately. But that's again, people some people are making a living out of sharing street photography bangers. Um, so I, I understand the logic, but I don't like it. Yeah, that's that's true. Imagine like you're doing, uh, I don't know, each time you're going out, you're doing um, uh, banger street photography and it's, uh, then you don't have this satisfaction when you're, you know, you're doing a good picture in three days or four days. Uh, um, and there's another thing that I want to talk about. Um, I don't know if you have this feeling as well, but personally, when I, when I'm out on the streets and I press the shutter button and without looking at the pictures or without seeing the picture, I know that I, I got a good picture. Yeah. And it's it's a crazy intuition that you have. Like once you you, you press the shutter button, you know every every element in the frame is good, and you you got it. You captured the thing that you wanted, and you don't need a, a confirmation of that. You you just like know it. You know that's a, that's a pretty crazy feeling. Hundred percent. And I think this is the the drug, right? This is what uh, personally I'm drawn into uh, in terms of street photography. So it's having that feeling of I think I captured something unique and I think the framing is pretty good, but I don't need, I don't have the urge to review 
you know, if it's in focus or whatever. So that's that. I completely agree with you. And it's a very good point. And I think, you know, the listeners to this podcast, visual storytelling is not about, you know, how sharp a picture is. What are the micro contrast detail? Like this, not about that. It's about, does that image make you feel something? And I think I just, you know, talked about one of your pictures that made me feel something, whether the guy with the hands on, on the face or, or the, the, guy with the gun now i know that's not a condom so that's 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 that for that story <laughs> but uh i think for me that's that again that's what's most important the technical part i think of course if you do events like like you do you know people have to have their eyes in focus if, if you shoot and the, the 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 scene needs to be well lit and so on but that's a very different mindset talk about that the octavian how do you go from wearing a hat where you're like i want to tell stories to um one that you know, is I need to get the shot for the client. How, how do you manage that on a on a weekly basis? Um, well, it's um, like you have to be like I'm like work focused, and I know I have to to do my uh, uh, my job properly for clients that I'm working and delivering. And uh, um, for me, yeah, as as you as you said, it um, street photography. It's like pure therapy and. Uh, have just um, I I don't know I I find my myself in a, in a good separation and a very good balance uh, being a photographer working for clients and um, doing street street photography on a on a regular basis. Um, I have um, also like when I'm doing YouTube videos POV um, street photography. I dedicate normally one day when I'm gonna shoot only street photography. So I'm out with my with my camera and my my GoPro. And um, I'm just enjoying the day, but I'm I'm in the moment. I'm I'm trying to get as much as I can uh, during that day. And I know that next day I'm going back to, to working for clients and uh, in doing the the pictures the, the client need. So um, for me, it works very well when when you find this uh, this balance uh, between nice your your photography. Yeah. Yeah. So that's it's good to hear again because I, I know a lot of people are struggling with that. A portion of, of being a photographer. Uh, Octavian, what, what would you say, and this is pretty much, a, uh, we're, we're nearing the end of the podcast, but I want you to talk about, you know, kind of what would you say to a younger Octavian or uh, somebody who wants to get into the photography world? Uh, what would be your, your advice? Because to your point, a lot of people want to do street photography, want to do photography in general. What would be your advice? Uh, I know it sounds a little bit cliche, but um, I guess you have to start with the classics. Um, the more you you look at photography, the more you you understand the, the history of photography and how the, the photography developed over the years from uh, from the beginnings to, um, to let's say to now, which it, it changed a little bit the, the approach, it changed the uh, the way of street photography is um, understood now. Um, so first of all, you have to, the, the more you look at street photography, the more you understand the, the history of, of photography, uh, the better you are. It's like, uh, if you want to write an essay or write a book, the more you read, uh, the better you get. Like, um, so this, this is one, probably one, one, one good advice. And the, the second one, like never quit and just, uh, just go out and shoot because, uh, uh, you never know. You have like uh, maybe two weeks when you you don't get any good shot, and uh, I don't know. One uh, one day you you get three good shots. Um, so yeah, probably print your print your photos as well. I don't do it uh, as much as I as I want, but uh, it's something it's something very satisfying when uh, looking at the at the printed picture and you see and you understand it differently. I guess so. Yeah. So important. I completely agree with the well everything you said, but uh, especially the last point about printing your work. For me, it changed the way I look at my images, and sometimes you know what you see on screen is very different than what you will feel once it's printed. So get a printer. I don't care, you know, Canon, Epson, whatever, and doesn't have to be one that's super expensive. But you know, try printing some work. Try printing some stories. And if you don't have a printer, of course, there are still, imagine or not, believe it or not, labs where you can print yep. <laughs> photos. And I encourage you to you know, go local and, 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 and go see them and have your work printed. Well, Octavian, it's been such a pleasure to 
have a chat with you. If people want to learn more about your YouTube stuff and your photography and what's next for you, where should they go? They should uh, definitely go on um, on my new website. Um, it's octavianstreet.com. So uh, um, thank you for having me. Um, they will find the links to YouTube and all the information on my brand new website dedicated to street photography. Um, so, yeah. Perfect. And we will put the link in the show notes. So make sure you click on Octavian's website and see all about what he's doing at the moment and the future work. And if you like what you're hearing, if you like this series of podcasts, please, this is, by the way, an ad-free podcast. So what we ask you to do is to go in the comments of Apple Podcast or YouTube uh, or Spotify and leave a comment and rate it five star if you like it or share it with your friends, because I'm sure you have a photographer, friend or somebody who's interested in visual storytelling that might benefit from hearing conversations like this one we had today. Until then, if you want to communicate with me you can find me at fred ranger on youtube also just like octavian we have similar channels like i said so you should follow both of us <laughs> and uh, <laughs> also on twitter and instagram of course always under fred ranger and my website is fredranger.com so octavian i wish you a very pleasant reminder of the week and hopefully we're going to meet in person in brussels or montreal or wherever we are in the world and thank, thank you, you so fred much. yeah see you soon see you soon thank you cheers bye bye
Cheers. <laughs>